Thank you so much for coming today. It's a beautiful September day, so I appreciate you all being here. Um, my name is Rebecca Taffel, and I work at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. Um, I'm the director of programs there, and I work with uh, Elizabeth Sackler to provide additional support to the Sackler Center here at, um, at the Brooklyn Museum. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Patricia Alvers here today. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, we've had a great year so far of having um, biographies on wonderful women artists. We've had a biography on Alice Neal, one on Lee Krasner, and I'm so happy to add Joan Mitchell to, um, to the list of wonderful programs we've had so far. Um, for the past five years, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art has continued to fulfill its commitment to the past, present, and future of feminist art. Using its award-winning exhibition and education spaces, the Sackler Center strives to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions, dialogue and debate about feminist art, theory, and activism uh, take place in the Sackler Center's forum. Groundbreaking exhibitions are held in its feminist art and her story galleries. Currently, these galleries uh, feature the historically groundbreaking show, Materializing Six Years, Lucy, Lepard, Lucy R. Lepard and the Emergence of Conceptual Art. Um, it's a wonderful exhibition that Catherine Morris, our curator, has been working on for a long time. Um, it's amazing, uh, <laughs> and it explores Lucy Lepard's hugely significant 1973 book. So if you haven't seen it, please go see it afterwards. There's a wonderful catalog that the, um, the center produced that's really exceptional as well. Um, but above and beyond an exhibition, just an exhibition space, the center is uh, a place for open and free discourse, conversation, and the exchange of ideas. Um, we celebrate dialogue and debate. Um, Dr. Sackler could not be here today because of some, of some ongoing health issues, but she asked me to express how delighted she is to have Patricia join us here today to illuminate the life and work of Joan Mitchell, one of the few women to thrive and find success during the aggressive and male-dominated West Village scene of abstract expressionism. Determined, abrasive, intense, difficult, rude, and these were the types of words her friends used to describe her. Uh, she, was, she was an artist whose work, whose abstract work at the same time was beautiful, lyrical, and graceful. Um, Patricia Albers explores these complexities and contradictions uh, of Joan Mitchell's life with skill and great detail in her book. Um, in his review of the book in the New York Times, critic Jed Pearl wrote that, quote, Patricia Albers has written a book about Mitchell that I cannot imagine will ever be improved upon. So graceful and incisive is her account of the artist's hell-bent life and lyrical art. According to the New Yorker, quote, like Mitchell's vast canvases, Albers' impressive book ought to be experienced in the morning, for it can animate the entire day. And book list named uh, the book Joan Mitchell, Lady Painter, one of the top 10 biographies of 2011. If you haven't rec read it yet, I highly recommend it. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, Patricia Albers is a San Francisco Bay Area writer and teacher. Her most recent book is Joan Mitchell, Lady Painter, A Life, the first biography of the New York school painter published uh, by Knopf. Albers' first book, Shadows, Fire, Snow, The Life of Tina Modotti, was based in part on her discovery in the attic of an Oregon farmhouse of a trove of Modotti photographs and letters that American Photo praised as adding, quote, an amazing chapter to one of the most passionate lives in art. Shadows, Fire, Snow received a starred review in Publishers Weekly and was named by the Library Journal as the best book of 1999. Albers also organized the exhibition Tina Modotti and the Mexican Renaissance for Moderna Musee in Stockholm, uh, the City Museum of Helsinki, and the Art Photo Photography Festival in France. Heralded in a front page story in Le Monde as, quote, the, uh, the first great exhibition, Modotti exhibition in France, it drew the largest crowds of any exhibition in the festival's 31 year history. Uh, she's the recipient of the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund Grant and U Cross Foundation Writing Residency. She's currently working on 
the first biography of Hungarian-born photographer Andrzej Kertes. Did I say that right? <laughs> she also teaches modern art history and the history of photography at San Francisco State University. Uh, please help me welcome Patricia Alvarez. So thank you, Rebecca, for that lovely introduction. It's a great privilege for me to be speaking at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And thank you to all of you for coming out on this beautiful afternoon. In 1972, the painter Joan Mitchell received a letter from Marcia Tucker, a curator of painting and sculpture at New York's Whitney Museum. Tucker was offering Mitchell a solo exhibition at the Whitney two years hence. But Mitchell forwarded the letter to her then dealer, David Anderson of Martha Jackson Gallery, with a note about this Whitney bit, which of course we cannot do. And then she ticked off the reasons why. First, because the only work she would want to show would be traveling at that time. Second, she objected to Tucker's plan to pair her exhibition with an exhibition by the painter Lee Krasner. Mitchell felt that her work clashed with Krasner's, but also, she said, she smelled the ghettoization of women artists. Tucker was using her, Mitchell ranted, to build her own reputation as a feminist curator. Anderson disagreed. Plus, he said it would be nuts to turn down the Whitney. So at this point, this was 1972, Mitchell's uh, career had been in doldrums since, well, for about 10 years. Uh, 60s pop art had displaced abstract expressionism, and that was the label that was typically given to Joan Mitchell's work. Moreover, Mitchell had been living in France for the past 13 years, since 1967, in the village of Veteuil, which is about 35 miles northwest of Paris, so off the power grid of the art world. In the 60s, she'd had relatively few opportunities to show her work. In 1963, 64, 66 and 70, she had had no solo shows at all. And in her entire career, she'd had only one museum exhibition, and that was a show that had closed six months earlier at the Everson Museum in Syracuse, New York. All the same, she adamantly did not want to be among the female artists being rediscovered by feminist critics and curators. In New York, Anderson met with Tucker and persuaded her to decouple Mitchell's show from Krasner's. And then he started in working on Joan again. And more foot dragging ensued. But eventually she backed into a yes. I cannot commit myself to anything. I might paint well in the next two years, and I might not. Disaster. Don't want to fall flat on my face on half a floor at the Whitney. Of course, I'll paint and do my best. Do we need the Whitney? I'll take a crack at it. Mitchell spent the next two years painting her show for the Whitney, including 10 single canvases and 12 multi-paneled works, among them nine big diptychs the largest nine by 24 feet. It was a monumental achievement. Still, that show, which opened on March 26, 1974, was not widely reviewed. After all, the 70s was a decade of pluralism. It was the time of process art, body art, earthworks, performance art. Almost anything, it seemed, except painting 
and especially painting as romantic calling. Painting was supposedly dead. Mitchell responded by throwing out her chest and proclaiming herself A-E-O-H, Abstract Expressionist Old Hat. <laughs> and in fact, her show was warmly received by the public, including by many young artists who had never before seen her work. Most of these paintings were what Mitchell called her field and territory paintings. So paintings that she thought of as sanctuaries for particular people or dogs that she loved. Um, sanctuaries that were inspired, like all of her mature work, by memories of her feelings about particular places experienced at particular times. Uh, typically, she wouldn't say which ones. So in the case of Wet Orange, for example, one of these field and territory paintings, we do know that she told a friend that something she saw, possibly a wet flower, made her fall in love with this particular orange right here. Even though orange was a color that she had long disliked, and then she decided to pair that orange with the lavender blue of the Golois Bleu cigarette pack. No doubt the fields and bodies of water around the village of Veteuil also play a role in this marvelous assortment of rectangles. Now, as I mentioned, most of the paintings in that show were multi-paneled. Uh, Mitchell's favorite format, again, as in wet orange, is a horizontal triptych made up of three vertical panels. What she's doing here, and in fact in all of her multi-paneled works, is not telling a story as in a cartoon panel, but rather conveying a kind of sensory overload, uh, giving us four images all at the same time. The first one, the second one, the third one, and the whole. And doing that was one reason why she loved that triptych format. Another reason was because of the contrast between the straight cuts between the panels and the very hand-done quality of her marks. She was also interested in all the things she could make happen around those cuts emphatically stopping the colors in some places, and in other places, such as here, implying their continuity. Moreover, she liked the fact that the vertical cuts undermined the panoramic sense of landscape. You do it one way, she said, and then deny it. And that's an idea that she put into practice in many ways in both her life and her art. Mitchell's studio in Victoria was not huge. And here then is a, an image of her painting area in that studio. Notice, for example, that beam across the ceiling. So that beam was nine feet, two inches high, and that limited the height of her painting. The width was a problem, too. So when she did these large multi-paneled works, she typically could not fit all three panels side by side in her studio. As I said, some of these paintings were up to 24 feet wide. So when she was doing works like Les Bleuets, which we see here, and this one is 19 feet wide, she would work on panels one and two and keep panel three in her head, or she'd work on panels two and three and keep panel one in her head. She had an extraordinary visual memory. Often, in fact, she did not see an entire triptych until it was in the gallery, or in this case, in the museum, where it was going to be shown. And yet, pictorially, she knew exactly what she was doing. 
So to finish the story then of the uh, Whitney exhibition, three months before the show, Tucker visited Mitchell at her home in order, in order to interview her and make final arrangements for the show. So this, in fact, is that house in Veteuil. As you can see, it's up on a cliff. We're looking up from the road in front of it. In front of this road was a field, and in front of that was the River Seine. So Tucker then walked through the front door of this house, and when she did, Mitchell yelled, Hello, Madame Whitney has arrived. <laughs> and she did not bother to get up from her chair. In the days that followed, she baited and harangued Tucker. However, when Mitchell's companion, the Canadian painter Jean-Paul Riappel, tried to flirt with Tucker, Mitchell shouted, and I'm omitting the obscenities here, she's here for my work and don't you forget it. Riappel responded by throwing a plate of fried eggs at Mitchell's head, and Tucker too had to duck. The critic Peter Sheldahl once called such stories, and there are many, Joan Mitchell sacred monster trading cards. So it's an understatement to say that Mitchell was a mass of contradictions. She was nasty and brutal and wise and kind. She hurt and embarrassed people, and yet she was extremely generous especially to young artists and especially to young female artists. She bought their work at ridiculously high prices and she gave them money, art supplies, studio space, liquor, and fancy French desserts and often did so with great sensitivity and tact. In her essay for the Whitney catalog, Tucker generously wrote of Mitchell's overwhelming intellectual and physical energy, her vast curiosity, and her blunt, disconcerting honesty. Mitchell's attitude toward feminism was equally self-contradictory. For example, she believed that feminist activists were inferior artists who organized to cover up their inferiority. And she refused to carry the flag of feminism in any way. Yet from an early age, she defied gender expectations. In her review of, Whitney, of Mitchell's show at the Whitney, the critic Barbara Rose recalled a 1957 article in Life magazine. It's the article here. It was titled, Women Artists in Ascendance. So this was an article that had featured five uh, prominent female artists, um, Helen Frankenthaler here, Grace Hardigan, Nell Blaine, Jane Wilson was on a separate page, and down here we have Joan Mitchell. Mitchell Hardigan and Frankenthaler in particular had made an, an indelible impression on Rose, she wrote, quote, with their huge paintings, standing there confidently in paint splattered jeans, when their contemporaries were all wearing Tweety classics in the suburbs, terrorized by the feminine mystique. So where does this contradictory creature, Joan Mitchell, come from? Joan Mitchell was born in 1925, born and raised in Chicago, the younger daughter in a wealthy, ambitious, and accomplished family. Her maternal grandfather had been an engineer who designed bridges, erected the load-bearing structure for the Statue of Liberty, and worked on some of the earliest steel frame skyscrapers. His engineering drawings, which Mitchell kept all her life, were important to her for their rigorous construction. 
Her mother, you see here on the right, was a lyric poet who instilled in Joan a lifelong love of poetry, the art form she considered most analogous to her own. Mitchell wanted for her art, she said, the feeling in a line of poetry which makes it different from a line of prose. Meaning, I think, in part, that as with lyric poetry, what Mitchell's work says is inseparable from the way in which it is said. As for her father, he was a dermatologist, an enthusiastic amateur artist, and a stern taskmaster who ordered his daughter to earn top grades, bring home sports trophies, and do accomplished works of art. And she did. Her childhood name was Bullethead, and it fit. <laughs> but her father also told her that because she was a girl, she would always be second rate. Apparently, he never got over the fact that she had not been born a boy. According to the family story, um, he had filled out the paperwork at the hospital when she was born, and he had written, under name, he had written John. And then, of course, he had to make a fast change, so he just crossed out the H, and that's how she got the name Joan. In any case, when she was 12, he required that she choose her life's work. She hesitated between writing and art, but finally chose art. And then he responded, art? You can't draw. How can you be an artist? You can't draw. So Joan's relationship with her father was a very mixed bag. He inspired her, competed with her, challenged her, undermined her self-confidence, and scared her although he forbid her to show any sign of fear. Nor did he allow her to, quote, diddle with things. For the next 55 years, she devoted herself single-mindedly to her art, although in high school she was also a nationally ranked figure skater. After graduation, she attended Smith College and then she transferred to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she studied anatomy, art history, and life drawing, which was the core of the school's curriculum. As a student, Joan Mitchell joined the Communist Party and engaged with socially concerned art. Uh, much of her student work consists of melancholic and poetic depictions of working people, beggars, and waifs. Inspired by Picasso's painting of the blue period, like Old Guitarist, which was, and still is, in the collection of the Art Institute. And by the stark and dramatic prints of the German artist Kathy Kollwitz, who dignified the suffering of the powerless and poor. Joan admired Colwitz for her draftsmanship and viewed her as a role model, a wealthy woman who was nonetheless committed to social justice and commanded respect as a champion of the people. Joan spent the summers of 1945 and 1946 living in an apartment in Guanajuato, Mexico with a view of a mountain that was called La Bufa. She knew Cezanne's work, of course, from the Art Institute, and she admired the aliveness and the rigor of his landscapes, as well as the way he addressed his shifting perceptions of space as he moved through it. In La Bufa, her work here on the right, she takes cues from Cezanne and especially his many paintings of the Mont Saint-Victoire, this mountain in southern France that Cezanne painted repeatedly. So like Cezanne, she uh, conceives of her painting in terms of angled planes. She sets up linear continuities among 
objects at various distances. So that's happening here, for example. And she's playing off rupture and continuity uh, with that bisecting of the image, so anticipating the strategies that she would use in those later multi-paneled works. After graduating, 1947, Joan spent 13 months on a fellowship in France, where she painted intensely, yet felt increasingly uncertain about both her subject matter and her style. In 1949, in France, she married Barney Rossett, who had been her schoolmate at Francis Parker School in Chicago and who later, at Joan's urging, purchased the then tiny publishing company, Grove Press. In the 1950s, after Barney and Joan divorced, so this was a short-lived um, marriage, Rossett became the American publisher of Samuel Beckett, Henry Miller, and many others, and a champion of First Amendment rights. In many ways, he challenged and changed American publishing, and American culture. So Mitchell and Rossett then married 1949. They would divorce in 1952. But almost all of their lives, they had a, a very close relationship. It was a, a scrappy brother-sister kind of thing, close but fraught. So going back then to 1949, after the marriage, Mitchell and Rossett then moved to New York City. And in New York, Joan painted this work, Figure and the City, which is probably a self-portrait. And in any case, such a failure, she felt, that even as she was working on it, she knew she would never again paint the human figure. But what next? One day, a few months later, she walked into the Whitney Museum, which was then on 8th Street downtown, and she was stunned by Willem de Kooning's attic. This was the first time she had ever seen de Kooning's work. Seeing that painting, and later others by de Kooning, transformed her own art. De Kooning's raw, muscular canvases gave her permission to shed the vestiges of that academic training and to paint with more freedom and immediacy. They also gave her permission to acknowledge her love of paint as material substance and to explore its intrinsic qualities. She learned, too, from what de Kooning called his leaps of space and from his interlocking forms and his unstable figure-ground relationships, meaning uh, the way he undermined the traditional relationship between the objects uh, he depicted and their, their backgrounds. And then finally, de Kooning opened up for her the, the many, many possibilities of abstraction. Her first self-consciously important work after this encounter with de Kooning's work was cross-section of a bridge. Now, bridges had long been one of Joan's favorite subjects, thanks to her engineer grandfather. But what her earlier bridge images had missed and abstraction could accommodate, she now realized, were her feelings about bridges. In a talking about feelings in both the emotional and the physical senses of the word. For example, a cross-section of a bridge offers us glimpses of a patch of water, there, that, that blue triangle, um, reflections, possibly some cables over there on the left, at the same time as it evokes the sensation of being in the flux of water and light on the underside of an urban bridge. By 1954, 
when Mitchell was doing paintings like this one, so paintings that have to do with her feelings about weather and urban space, she had long since started hanging out at the Cedar Tavern, the Artist Club. So these were both places where progressive downtown artists would meet to talk, drink, debate, and so forth. And she'd become friends with de Kooning, with the painter Franz Klein, the poet Frank O'Hara, and many others. She had also participated in the landmark Ninth Street show. She'd had two solo shows in New York City, and she was a regular in the important stable annual. And yet she felt she wasn't living up to her own standards. Uh, this 1954 was a year of crisis, both personal and professional. And it was a crisis severe enough that she made a half-hearted attempt at suicide. She told one friend that it wasn't much fun being nuts. What did she mean? Well, as far back as kindergarten, Joan had known that she experienced the world differently for most people. Uh, one day in kindergarten, the kindergarten teacher had mentioned to the class the red A on their alphabet chart. And Joan had jumped up and said, no, no, the A isn't red, it's green. And the other kids had, of course, given her that, you're so weird, look. And it, she sat down and clammed up. In other words, she had synesthesia. As I'm sure many of you know, synesthesia is an innate, lifelong, involuntary condition in which when one of the senses is stimulated, that sense responds and another one does too. Some synesthetes see sounds, others hear flavors, and still others taste shapes. In certain forms of synesthesia, things like letters, numbers, and personalities trigger colors, flavors, or shapes. Joan Mitchell had at least four forms of synesthesia. First, she had colored letters, meaning that she saw the letters of the alphabet in color. So her A, for example, was always that kind of fern green. But as she points out there in a note to a friend, uh, this chart that she made doesn't truly convey the effect. For one thing, the colors of synesthesia are not the colors of pigment, but the colors of light. Joan also saw sounds, music included, as abstract colored shapes moving as if on a screen in front of her. So these were shapes that varied consistently with pitch, timber, and volume. Now, colored letters and colored sounds are very common forms of synesthesia. In addition, Mitchell had two rare forms. She experienced colored personalities and colored emotions. For her, hope was literally yellow. It wasn't that hope made her think of yellow, but yellow was what hope was. Loneliness was dark green and clingy, and depression was silvery white. Absolute horror, she said, just horror. Moreover, Mitchell had eidetic memory, which is anecdotally related to synesthesia, although the research remains sketchy. She stored important memories in what she referred to as her mental suitcase or her mental album of photographs. I carry my landscapes with me, she said. And she was able to call them up in their sensory and emotional fullness, to relive them, in effect. Such perceptions, said Mitchell, were very, very present for her. And yet, apparently, she never knew that synesthesia is a named, normal, and shared condition 
now known to affect about 5% of the population. Um, synesthesia had been known and studied since the early 19th century. However, during much of the 20th century, it fell by the wayside, and it wasn't until 1993, which was the year after Mitchell's death, that the publication of a book titled The Man Who Tasted Shapes brought synesthesia back to wide scientific and public attention. Today, neuroscientists are able to test for synesthesia using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, which measures local increases in oxygenation, an indirect sign of neural activity. And meanwhile, debate continues over conceptual models for synesthesia. And research promises not only a better understanding of the phenomenon itself, but also a brain development of the links between emotion and reason, and perhaps the very nature of consciousness. By 1955, Joan Mitchell had survived some hard-won battles with herself. And it turned a negative into a positive. By now intentionally using her synesthetic perceptions in her art, she started drawing on her felt visual memories of particular trees, fields, lakes, rivers, and so on color, sound, her feelings about landscape, the flow of consciousness, and paint itself became congruent. Hudson River Dayline, for example, coalesces in the center of the canvas as if upon the artist's plane of consciousness, and uses her newly distilled exuberant and luminous color. If a painting was successful, and she felt that Hudson River Dayline was, then motion is made still like a fish trapped in ice, she said. It is trapped in the painting. My mind is like an album of photographs and paintings. I do not conceive. Now, I hasten to add that to say that Mitchell used her synesthesia in her art is not to say that she was illustrating her synesthetic perceptions or that her neurology explains her art. She was a very complex artist who used every tool available to her, including her synesthesia. Um, if one has precisely colored feelings, for example, that's an excellent tool, but still one has to make skilled use of it. The point is that to reduce her to a case would be to disregard her visual intelligence, her deep knowledge of art history, and her eventual creation of a distinct visual language. Some of Mitchell's greatest paintings date from the late 1950s. In George Went Swimming at Barnes Hole, but it got too cold, she chose as her subject memories of her feelings about a certain late summer afternoon at the beach, namely Barnes Hole Beach in Amagansett, with her beloved French poodle, George. And there we see Joan and George at that beach. Uh, she liked to start her paintings by putting herself into a mental space, thinking about uh, some positive experience, some experience of love. And here then those feelings about George and that afternoon manifest themselves in this area. So this was the first area she worked on intensely. You can see those yellows, other warm colors. But then as her thoughts strayed to a hurricane that had swept over the tip of Long Island that same summer, 1954, that was linked in her mind to this very difficult time for her, the painting took on a colder 
more ominous uh, cast up here with these uh, blues and whites. Nineteen fifty seven was also the year when Mitchell was the subject of an important article in Art News. And Art News was more or less the house organ of abstract expressionism. So Art News had this longtime signature series which was called So and So Paints a Picture, in which a writer would follow step by step the artist's process of creating uh, a work of art and also interview the artist along the way about his or her ideas, methods, and techniques. In the case of Mitchell Paints a Picture, the writer was the then fledgling critic Irving Sandler. Uh, so the article starts out then with Mitchell working on a painting called Bridge, and that's what we see her doing here. She's in her studio working on Bridge, but this was a painting that she, in fact, never finished because she felt that it lacked accuracy and intensity. So she was going to junk it. However, Sandler and another friend dropped by her studio just as that was about to happen. She was going to rip it apart, and they persuaded her to stop. A few weeks later, Mitchell called Sandler to say that she was leaving for Paris but that if he was over at her apartment within half an hour, he could have bridge. And if not, it was going out with the trash. So he dashed over to Mitchell's apartment. Bridge was saved. And eventually, Mitchell did accept it as a finished work of art. And today, it is a promised gift to the Brooklyn Museum. So Mitchell paints a picture, then continued by contrasting her experience with Bridge with that in doing her next painting, George went swimming at Barnes Hole, but it got too cold. So Joan did have uh, exposure. She did have critical support in the 1950s. And yet this was a time when most women, Mitchell included, felt they could not aspire to a place in art history, or for that matter, to equal chances of getting a show. The conventional wisdom held that women couldn't paint the way men could, as if it was a biological thing, and that in any case, men often had families to support, so they should get preferential treatment. Many galleries had unspoken quotas for women, uh, Joan loved to tell the story of showing her work to one New York dealer and being told, gee, Joan, if only you were French and male and dead. <laughs> According to the painter Jane Freilicher, the critic Clement Greenberg advised another dealer not to take any women at all because they just get pregnant. And to an extent, Mitchell internalized such attitudes. Uh, I thought I had it easier, she once said, because I never even thought that I could be in the major competition, being female. And yet she did compete. She was fiercely ambitious. She reasoned that if things were really tough for women, then women had to be really tough. Women artists who complained were whiners and crybabies in Joan Mitchell's book. Her own response to the situation was to become one of the boys, to drink, swear, have affairs, and paint big paintings with the best of them, to run with the pack. So here we see her then at the scene of some of that action, the, the Cedar Tavern. And I have one quick Cedar Tavern story for you because I think that it epitomizes her mode of operation. So one evening she was at the Cedar, she was drinking at the bar, when up comes the painter Landis Lewitton. He was 33 years older than Joan, a painter who was deeply respected for his knowledge of the craft of painting. So he comes up 
uh, behind her then, and he reaches around and cups one of her breasts in his hand. Without missing a beat, Joan swings her arm down and hooks Lewitin between the legs. The place froze. <laughs> so why did she not make common cause with other women? Well, that seemed pointless because as her friend, the painter Miriam Shapiro said, speaking of the same period, women didn't really respect each other. I don't think that another woman at that time really cared about my opinion of her work, said Shapiro. We talked about our love lives, shared each other's romances, but I can assure you, we never came together over painting. So here then we see uh, Joan Mitchell, Helen Frankenthaler, and Grace Hardigan at the opening of one of Frankenthaler's exhibitions. Uh, three of them, uh, Hardigan and Mitchell in particular, saw a lot of each other, and there were a lot of good times between them, but there was also competition and backbiting. Hardigan said that Mitchell had talent and virtuosity, but lacked the real thing. Mitchell dismissed Frankenthaler, whose work involved pouring thinned uh, pigment on raw canvas as that tampon painter. <laughs> Beginning in 1955, Joan Mitchell spent long periods in France. And in 1959, she moved to Paris. Why move to Paris when New York and all it represented were so important to her? Well, because she had fallen in love with the French-Canadian painter Jean-Paul Riappel, who lived in Paris. So Riappel is not widely known in the United States, but in Canada he is considered the leading 20th century modernist, and his name is a household word. So here then we see the two of them in those early years, and we also see two of their works. On the top is Mitchell's canvas to the harbor master, and below is Riappel's titled Landing. So these two, they were very mutually supportive, and I think they were mutually influential as well. Uh, Mitchell was inspired by Riappel's work to activate her often empty edges, for example. Riappel was inspired by Mitchell's to take greater risks to experiment with brush strokes as form, and at times to make work that was almost lyrical. After she settled in France, Mitchell's palette changed. She began using many deep greens, cerulean blues, and pinks and corals. Her work retains its New York swagger, but also partakes of European pastoralism. The work is sometimes panoramic, as in the six by 10 foot Grand Carriere, which is today in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And even more than in earlier works, there's a highly disruptive syntax here that makes it impossible to process the work in a rational way. Mitchell's paint is swiped, dripped, dry brushed, slathered, applied with many kinds of brushes, rubbed on with fingers or rags. You can see what are probably fingers right here. And sometimes even stuck on like a wad of gum. There are lines like live wires up here, for example, and as here, these patches that are like fine mist. And yet, despite all this incident and variety, the paintings are always carefully structured. You know, the stereotype of the abstract expressionist painter, of course, is that she's simply, you know, 
flung her feelings on the canvas. Yes, Joan Mitchell did paint in the physical, whole body manner of the athlete she once was. And yes, she did take advantage of accident. But she always worked from a mental image, from a careful plan for her picture, whose evolution she would stop and ponder from the opposite end of her studio after every few strokes. She would apply her paint often with great energy. And yet, overall, she was a slow painter. I stop, look, and listen at railroad tracks, she said. I really want to be accurate. For that kind of accuracy, she looked to, among others, Bach, whose music she played obsessively in the early 60s. Like Bach, she was seeking something abstract, yet emotionally precise. 1962 also saw the emergence of pop art, a movement for which Mitchell had little but scorn. In her paintings of the early 60s, it's almost as if the embattled Mitchell was saying, take that pop art, take that. This is what real painting looks like. In 1967, she purchased the property in Veteuil, which was a house, as I said, overlooking the Seine. It included uh, the big house up on the hill, but also a smaller house on the road below, where the Impressionist Claude Monet had lived between 1878 and 1881. Mitchell often had an ecstatic response to nature. And nowhere is this more evident than in work like My Landscape Two and other works from this period, late 60s, early 70s. So My Landscape Two then being a kind of image poem in which water is paint and paint is water and hills and fields lapse into lines and shapes, colors and light, and then reassert themselves as landscape experienced at a moment of intense and unnameable revelation. Her new house had a large garden where she grew vegetables and flowers, especially sunflowers, which she loved and intensely felt. Sunflower feelings now became one of her favorite subjects. Whether young or mature, sprouting or dying, sunflowers often brought her a sensation of psychic merging. I become the sunflower, the lake, the tree, she said. I no longer exist. In the early 50s, she had addressed and tried to overcome such feelings through psychoanalysis. Now she embraced them and used them in her art. Blue plays an important role in Mitchell's work of the 1970s, partly because of the weather and light in the Valley of the Seine. So her house then near the river, uh, sometimes she said there were these moments when she would experience magical late in the day, uh, times when everything seemed to turn blue. But her blues were not only about her feelings for the sin, they were also about the other bodies of water she knew and loved, especially Lake Michigan. And in fact, she claimed that every painting she ever did began with the Lake Michigan of her Chicago childhood. Like eidetic memory, painting for Joan Mitchell collapsed time and space and escaped terminations, sadness, and death. Moreover, painting was the place where she confronted and dealt with the circumstances of her life. 
When Riappel left her after 24 years together, she painted La Vie en Rose, a four-paneled painting that's approximately nine and a half feet high by 22 feet wide and is now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. Rose had been Riopelle's nickname for Mitchell, and of course the title refers to, to Edith Piaf's signature song. Mitchell's La Vie en Rose is a work of passion, but also restraint. It's tender and bleak, animated and empty. Similarly, after Mitchell was diagnosed and treated for cancer of the jaw in 1985, she turned, still in a state of despair, to painting. Among other works, she did Faded Air One, so a painting that seems in precarious balance, um, in which that, that spiky scrawl of pigment on the left kind of pitches diagonally toward that rising tower of scribbles on the right. The painting's emotional trigger, she told a friend, had been, quote, the tragic and beautiful sunflowers dying in autumn and the fall cool sun, that cold yellow, superb. Uh, in this painting, she also uses, as we see right here, cobalt green which is an unusual semi-transparent bluish green verging on gray that became one of her fetish colors around this time and a very unhappy one said the artist. Moreover, Faded Air One takes inspiration from Box Coral Cantata number 78, specifically from its ascending aria. Throughout her career, Mitchell looked and learned from everyone, and she did a lot of savvy borrowing. Cezanne, Matisse, and Van Gogh were her gods. So here then is uh, an example, particularly direct example, uh, of, of that relationship with Van Gogh. So this is a kind of homage to Van Gogh, an artist to whom she felt deeply indebted uh, for the ways in which she addressed color, space, and mark making, and with whom she felt a deep kinship. You know, for both artists, um, painting was a way to make life bearable. By now, Mitchell had been forging ahead for three decades, saddled all the while with the somewhat disparaging label second-generation abstract expressionist. While staying true to the path she had set in her 50s, she had continued to make her own rules, and her art had continued to evolve. For Mitchell, painting was far from exhausted. She was one of those artists who doesn't fit easily into a standard narrative. Um, she herself said, the moment something is clarified, it is dead. Over the years, she had often referred to herself as a lady painter. So this was a phrase that she took from the fact that back in Chicago in the 20s and 30s, her mother had often been referred to as a lady poet. And to give you an example then of how Mitchell, uh, Joan Mitchell used the phrase, so 1988, she was in San Francisco for the opening of her traveling retrospective at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. At this point, she was 63 years old. Her health was fragile. Uh, because of her cancer of the jaw, she had many problems with her gum and her teeth. She'd had one hip replacement. She needed another. Her arthritis was getting worse, and she wore thick, yellowish magnifying lens glasses. So here she is walking through the installation of her show at the museum and she doesn't like anything. She doesn't like the way the museum is laid out. 
She doesn't like the installation. She doesn't like the other exhibitions in the museum. And she doesn't even like her own work. So she starts apologizing to the curators for the ways in which her paintings fall short. And then suddenly, with a sweep of her arm and a shift of her tone, she says, not bad for a lady painter. And she kind of tosses her hair. I think everything is magnificent. And then as a kind of mock aside, I'm trying to act like a male painter. You know, where you say that everything you do is magnificent. <laughs> So I think then that this phrase, lady painter, um, ironic, defiant, aggrieved, but not whiny, says a lot about who Joan Mitchell was. One of Mitchell's last paintings, completed shortly before her death from lung cancer in 1992, is the nine by 12 foot Merci a painting whose bold strokes, vivid colors, and vast space make the viewer feel small. How Mitchell could do such a painting when she was dying of cancer remains a mystery. So in Merci, then, we see five forceful calligraphic shapes. One of them down here, white on white which she uses as shorthand for her lifelong adoration of painting. The lake is here, the sunflower, the tree, the blue and the orange, the white, Van Gogh, Cezanne, Matisse, and the great abstract expressionist mark, fear, fury, aloneness, and love. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions. Yes.
got some remarkable insights from them. Yes? The, um, the synesthesia and the abstraction, how much did she, did she expect people to recognize that, that what yellow meant to her or did she get the, some kind of impact? Okay, did she expect people to understand yeah, her, and her way of why, you know, thinking, yes, in, in terms of the synesthesia? <clears throat> no, she didn't. I mean, she was always quite private about the personal meaning of her work to her. She, that was one thing, and, and that was something private. She wasn't going to talk about it. She didn't expect people to get it. Uh, people could interpret her paintings as they liked and find in them something that they uh, meant to, 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 to viewers. Any questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned the fact that Kali, that some had labeled her a second generation abstract was somehow derogatory. Yes. And I wonder if you, why that is. Is that because it implies that her work is derivative or could we, is there a way to think about it chronologically or just? So why, why would the um, expression second generation abstract expressionist be considered der derivative? Because I think that term second generation implies second rate. It implies that someone came along and invented abstract expressionism and that she was a follower. Her own point of view about that was that they, everyone was there at the same time exploring and whether old or young, the artists were all, all in it together. And in fact, I, I, I think even the term abstract expressionism uh, sort of fits at the end of her life that she was doing something that went beyond just that. You know, she, she used that as a kind of starting point and, and kept going. Yes? I loved your 